it doesn't fail, at least in my experience, that when people are going through pain, adversity, through suffering, they ask three questions. First, why me? That's a great question. Why me? I've learned in my journey with God to ask a second question. Why not me? I'm not special. I'm human. I'm like everyone else. I'm going gonna, gonna to die of something. I mean, life is temporary. Let's be honest. The, good, the, the Bible says that it rains on the good and the evil. And sometimes life just happens, right? And it's not, you're not, God's not mad. You're not being picked on. You just happen to be there. Sometimes I just ask, Lord, why me? Then I ask, I get really more serious. I ask, why now? It just seems when you get your ducks in a row, God kicks them out in the street. What's that about? But the real question, the relentless question, the one we want to really focus on today is what for? We're in this series called When You're Going Through Hell, Don't Stop. Everyone goes through the fire, just not everyone gets burned. We acknowledge the fact of pain, but we believe that in God's economy, there's a purpose in the pain. And that purpose is realized through a process of growing and morphing and always becoming what God created us to be. You see, I am a faith walker, a fire walker, who is homesick for a home that I think I'll know when I get there, whose builder and maker is God. I'm on a quest, a sacred journey, from the here and now to the there and then, from the what I am and what I can be, from what I was and what I shall have in the future. This is an adventure. This is a quest. This is a journey. This is why it is so good to be alive. Every single day, I get up and I understand what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. I have this treasure in jars of clay. One translator said, or paraphraser said, I have this treasure in a peanut butter jar, right? Isn't it amazing that pe how people can thrill you and outdo anything you ever expected? And then sometimes you look at people and think, what were you thinking? Right? I mean, people can be amazing and they can be dumb as a brick. I mean, you can awaken with a case of the stupids and it lasts a whole week. <laughs> and you're thinking, who is this? It's in the jars of clay to show the all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Disraeli, the prime minister of England, said this, There is no education like adversity. Shakespeare poetically said, He jests at scars who never felt a wound. The question is, what is God's goal for our lives? Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, if you live by your feelings, you'll wake up most days thinking God hates you or has forgotten you or liked your brother better, right? God has a goal for you right now. If you are religious, you probably, you probably think what God's goal is, is to destroy you, to devastate you. God is a judge. God is mad. God is hacked off. God is in heaven mad as hell, right? He's just looking for somebody to thump on the head. Light up a camel so he can strike you dead. Just something, you know. He's, he's finicky. He's on a hair trigger. He's capricious. Pew, 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 pew. And he loves humbling people like you. That's how religion is. At least that's what I've heard. And yet listen to what Paul says about the heart of God. The Lord is not really being slow. Now he's talking, referring to the promise that God will come back and set all things right. And the world will one day be as he first intended. He says that promise seems to be you know, elusive, but it's not because God is waiting. He's being patient 
for your sake. He does not want. Now listen, he does not, it doesn't say he does not will. It says he does not want. In theology, we study two aspects of the nature of God. There is the will of God and the will of God. The will of God, the W-E-A-L, or you may understand the word decree, the decrees of God, the things that absolutely God says and happens, and the will, W-I-L-L, the emotional part. Isn't it interesting that all the way through the scriptures, God is presented to us in anthropomorphic terms. I just wanted to say that word. I haven't said it in so long. <laughs> anthropomorphic terms. Isn't that amazing? You say, what is that? Well, when, it wa- when God wants us to know that he sees us, it says that the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro, right? The eyes of the Lord. The Lord doesn't have any eyes. Does he have eyes? I don't know. The hand of the Lord is extended, right? In the Ten Commandments, God says he's jealous. We know these emotions. He, God is an emotional being, just like he created us. He's not willing to. It's not his desire that any should perish. Do people perish? They sure do. There is a heaven. There is a hell. We have ample warning. We have the gospel. We have the good news. We have the hope of heaven in Christ. We have the hand of God extended in a love that meets the demands of his holiness. But at the end of the day, this is my father's world. God wins. It's not his will that you face his judgment. He wants you to know his grace and his mercy. Some say it's it's God's goal not to devastate, but it's God's goal to reform you. God's into reformation. God's into stop stopping stuff. You you guys need to stop smoking. And before you look at the smokers and go... You need to stop eating chocolate, too. That's bad. Stop it. Desperate housewives, stop it now. Stop, stop, stop it. And I noticed some of you women this morning, on Mother's Day, all made up with makeup on your face. Stop it. Rings on your fingers, bells on your toes. What's the matter with you people? Tell me you've ever been under the burning finger of religions. Oh, just be better. I'm sick of being better. I don't want to be better. I want to be different. I don't want to be a better version of the old me. I want to be something different. That's why God's goal for you right now is transformation. That's Reformation is, ho- is changing the outside, hoping the inside, you know, will change. Transformation is changing us from the inside so that the outside then begins to look and reflect the condition of the inside. Religion is about painting the outside. Spirituality is about changing the heart. And when the heart changes, Everything changes. Your pocketbook changes. Your desires change. Your interests change. God is into transformation. Think about what God does to get a butterfly. He takes a caterpillar, the ugliest being on the planet, other other than some dogs I know, (laughs) who I will not name. Caterpillar goes through a process called metamorphosis to change the form. And out comes a beautiful butterfly. How does God create a pearl? He takes a clam and he puts sand inside and he causes irritation. And that clam is created so that they can excrete a milky kind of substance to kind of cover that that irritation. And over time, a pearl is created. How about a diamond? Coal plus time plus pressure equal a diamond. Our equation is simple. Pain plus God's purpose plus the process and time yields a flourishing, fruitful, firsthand faith. Somehow we think that because since we matter to God, 
that all of this stuff just happens. We go to church and it goes, we leave here more spiritual. No, we leave here hungry. (laughs) So we throw our Bibles up in the back of our cars and go eat and act like we haven't been to the trough for years. You don't believe that's true? Ask anyone who has ever worked in the food industry how hard it is to get anybody to work on Sunday because of the way they're treated by the church-going folk. Bunch of cheapoids. You don't tithe, you don't tip. Stay home. (laughs) Amen? Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't encourage me. I've got just a little bit of time. And when you think about this and you think about that, the idea that God goes to all the trouble. Why? I mean, if I were God and I knew some of you, I would just go. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Lord. (laughs) But you matter to God. You matter to God. Listen to a podcast the other day of a very famous person. Most of you know his name. He says, I don't talk about two things. I'm talking about politics. I don't talk about religion. I love talking about God because my fear of God has been tamed. I know that God is in a good mood. He's generous. He's good. He's gracious. He will set all things right, and he is mad about me. I am his favorite son, and so are you. I know how he feels when he thinks about you. You matter to God. And I think that's why Christianity is so hated. Christianity is not hated because we are a superior moral way to live. We should be, but we're not. We Christians act just about every way every broken, fractured human being can act. Can I hear an amen? We are a bunch of messed up people. Hello. Hello. But what we believe that sets us apart from the world is that God knows each of us and loves each of us as a person and an individual. Not as a group. A lot of religious people, a lot of pastors, a lot of church teaching I read these days talk about community. And community is so important. You need to be a part of the community. This is a community of believers. This is a spiritual community. And you need to be committed to the community. And what they really mean is, I want to control your life. I want you to be a part of the group. And since I am the gatekeeper of the group, I can tell you who's in the group and who's out of the group. Isn't that great? (laughs) You ever heard of the little fun religious ditty called excommunication? I used to think, you know, early on, I said, how can any church excommunicate anybody else? How can they do this? Now I know I'm sophisticated. I'm a sophisticated redneck. And here's what they believe. There are churches that believe that when Jesus died, that he earned a, a, a salvation, a justification, and that he deposited that grace And made the church the steward of that. And those of us who run the church, people like me, who've been to seminary and have an ordination certificate, don't think you got one. No, don't think you do. We get to decide who we give grace to and who we withhold it from. And excommunication is withholding from you attendance to the sacraments, which is also withholding from you the application of grace, both of which is not true. God bless our ailing brothers and sisters who believe that mess. I'll tell you the truth. You can come straight to God, call priesthood the believers. God knows you. You know him. You can bypass me. That sucks, but it's the truth. Right? I mean, you matter to God. You can know God and relate to God and walk with God. Now, it is true that as individuals who love Jesus, we choose, we choose to gather together as a tribe, as a movement of men and women who want to help other men and women find bread. 
I don't want to control anyone. I don't want to manipulate anything. That's why together we say we specialize in God's simple, not church complicated. It ain't very hard to be around here. We're just pretty simple people. We believe the book. We believe Jesus. We believe life is good. We believe God loves us as we are, not as we ought to be. Thank God. So, yeah, that design, you know, I'll clap on that. And since we know that in all things God is at work for those who love him, right? For the good, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. I'm predestined. I'm part of the elect. Well, how do you know you're part of the elect? Because I love Jesus. Do you love Jesus? You're part of the elect. Well, is it that simple? Yeah, because you know what? On your own, by yourself, left to your own devices, you wouldn't love Jesus. You'd do what most of the people in America today, hiding somewhere to keep from trying to confront him. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, that's where the pain comes from, conforming. Now, not conforming. I hate conformity. I've been defying convention since 1971. Conformity. This is what I learned about my parents' generation. My parents' generation were conformers. Now, we benefited from that. Are you with me? My dad went to the war. He fought the war. They said, go over there, drive that Jeep, shoot that guy, hide in that ditch, and then come home. And he didn't say, well, all right now. Let's talk about this. He just went and did it. And he came back home. A lot of people didn't. He came back home and they said, okay, go over there and stand in that seat and do this and we'll give you a paycheck. Shut up. Don't say anything about it. Do it. Here's a paycheck. Go home. He did it. Go to church. Why? That's what good people do. I asked my mother one time, why do we go to church? That's what good people do. I said, where do they go? They don't go to our church. <laughs> I know these people. I was a paper boy, had three paper routes in our small town. Trust me, if, if you have a paper boy, he knows more about you than you would like him to know. Oh, yeah. I know who slept it off in the car on Saturday night. Other things I won't mention. Still getting blackmail money from some of those people. Here are three things you need to know. Since God matters to you, Here's some good news. He resists answering your short-sighted, pitiful, little, do-or-die prayers. You know those prayers, right? We're like, we're like cats chasing a little toy. I gotta have it, gotta have it. Oh, Lord, please, 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 Lord. Oh, please, 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 Lord. Oh, please, Lord, 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 please, Lord. Please, Lord. Oh, give me a wife, Lord, please. Give me a wife. Oh, please, Lord. If I don't have a wife in six months, I'm going to give up on Lie. I think he looks at us and says, let's watch him squirm. Right? I mean, come on, you know, you've prayed prayers that you just thought, if God didn't answer that, if you don't answer this prayer, I'm not going to believe in you anymore. Kind of. Maybe. Have you ever just said, oh God, if you've ever done anything for me, do this. And he's going, <laughs> seriously, come on. I mean, let's be honest. If most of us got most of the prayers we prayed answered, we'd be more screwed up than we are now. Hello? I mean, seriously. God knows what you need. Amen? Should you pray what you want? Absolutely. Absolutely. Tell him what you want. You want a new car? Tell him. He may not give it to you. He may just laugh. He may say, oh, there they go again. You know. But that's how your kids are, right? Mama can't have. Mama can't have. Mama can't have. Oh, mama, mama, mama can't have. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love you. I love you. I'm going to leave home. Well, go. <laughs> you know what's great about this whole stuff is that because he loves you, because he's your heavenly father, he wants to know what you want. He knows what you want. He wants you to articulate it, but he's also good enough to say, not yes yet, 
Because some of the stuff we think we got to, oh, I got to have this job. Oh, God, if I don't have this job, my life is over. Really? How many of you have ever prayed for a job and you got it and it was hell? And you're thinking, what was I thinking? Lord, don't ever give me what I asked for again. Take what I asked for, think about it, and give me what I need. Amen? Amen. I love this prayer. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. He made me weak that I might be humble to obey. I asked for help that I might do great things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked God for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked God for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I ask God for all things that I might enjoy life. He has given me life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I ask for, but everything I hope for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. Amen. We sometimes are so short-sighted that we're like a little puppy chasing a shiny object toward the cliff. And if God didn't mercifully take our ball away, we would fall over to our destruction. He does all things well, ladies and gentlemen, and he does all things because he loves you. I'm telling you now, you can believe me later. If you love Jesus, God will always do the most generous and loving thing in your life despite the circumstances. You can take that to the bank. Here's what else he refuses to do. He refuses to fix me. I thought that's what church was for. I have people all the time email, would you go visit my, 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 my son? Uh, my son and his wife, have got a new baby. They moved down there to Nashville. They need to be going to church. Like, going to church is going to keep them out of trouble. Right? I think church was specially designed for the people who know how much trouble they're in. I always love the fact that people, you know, still to this day, I mean, Paul and I have been in Nashville 21 years, and for all those years, there are people get out of parole and come to church the next day. Yay, God. Didn't I see your picture on the paper? Didn't you get arrested? Yeah, but I love the Lord. All right, there we go. I mean, the one, th- the one bad thing about Christianity is the people you have to hang out with. <laughs> right? I mean, there are some scoundrels in, in, among us. Some red, I mean, rednecks, Christian rednecks. What's that about? Gee whiz. I mean, I know some Christians who embarrass me. How about you? But you know what? They're still my brother, they're still my sister. We're still on the same journey. And I understand where they are because God isn't into the fix. See, if you were a refrigerator, we'd be good to go. We'd just put in another part. But you're a person. Listen to this. His divine power, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life. Notice, we already have it. It's like the guy who has a... My first car, the 56 Chevrolet... Palace Super Sport. Oh, yeah, baby. Sexy. <laughs> now, I say that. It had a clutch and a, a clutch that slipped. You had to roll the windows up, and one of them wouldn't roll down. Can I hear an amen? It had a stick thing on the column, which looked like my grandmother. I fixed that the first day. I put a Hurst shifter on the floor. It's still a six-cylinder. You hit it, it sounded like a sewing machine on steroids. <laughs> Jack it up in the back. Oh, yeah. I looked cool. You put that same boy in a 2011 Mercedes. He looks around, he smells. That's leather. That's black leather from Germany. It doesn't get hot in the summer. 
He, this same boy in this 56 Chevrolet with a clutch, you know, and rolling, he looks at this thing and says, this is a spaceship. Is he going to have to learn how to drive the car all over again? Mm-hmm. That's how we are. We were a 56 Chevrolet with a clutch that slipped. We've now met Jesus. We got a brand new car. The windows won't roll down because they're electric, Bubba. I can't find the clutch because it's automatic shift, goofball, right? I mean, it's like learning a whole nother language. And so if you are a young follower of Jesus, no wonder this is awkward for you. You think that meeting Jesus fixed everything. For eternity, yes, but for right now, boy, it's every man for himself, right? I mean, you got to get with it. He's given us, but then he says, for this very reason, may every effort to add. You got to add something to this? Yes. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. For you possess these qualities in increasing measure. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of Christ. I'm telling you, there are millions and millions and millions of people who claim to be Christians in this country who are in this condition. They know Jesus, but they are worthless to the rest of the world. I know that was harsh, but sometimes you have to say harsh things. Don't feel bad about it. That's okay what the book says and just go with the book i mean think about it. how many people do you know all they know jesus loves me this i know for the bible tell me so i left my brain at home today i really don't know what to say <laughs> i just think that stuff up just like that i hope you appreciate it And that's why I think a lot of people look at Christianity and think it's about being brain dead, not being intelligent, not being smart, not thinking. Because just God fixes us. No, God joins us. And because he loves us, he wants us. He's committed. Here's the third thing. He's committed to a process, a process of conforming and transforming our lives of growing us up. Listen, only the life rooted in the eternal purposes of God can walk through the refiner's fire and come out on the other end confident, courageous, full of joy and ready to live a big life. That ought to be you. That ought to be me. You see, the Christian hope is a present possession. Yay, God. But the Christian life, hey, that's a daily, lifelong process of becoming what we already are and possessing what we already have. That's what makes it so weird. See, religion says, here, okay, you get enough to start with God. Now you got to, okay, now... This is, I'm going to give you seven days worth of forgiveness, and now you better be back next Sunday or we're going to take it back. Christianity, on the other hand, says, God says, here it is, you got it all. But now you're going to have to spend the rest of your life unpacking it and, and discovering how great it is to know God and love God. So in this process, there are three levels of change going on constantly all the time. There's the change that comes by the renewal of my mind. I'm starting to think differently. Therefore, I urge your brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. That means that's motion, that's moving, that's doing something. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind, so that you may test and approve God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what is he saying? Is life is lived with the mind. It's our mind that God wants to. That's where temptations always come. They're always directed at the mind. Most people I know think temptation is about the emotion. I, you know, and, 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 and so let's just use an example. Alcohol. Alcohol, the temptation to abuse alcohol, is directed at the mind. We think it's directed at the emotion. That's why when we attack it with our emotions, we always lose because it is a temptation directed to the mind. You think differently. You think drinking alcohol is cool and hip 
and it makes you, you know, smarter or may help to make you escape. The truth of the matter is it makes you sick. Duh. Your emotions say, man, this hurts right. I'm going to get drunk tonight. I was going to pass out in my own vomit. Boy, praise the Lord. Isn't that great? Don't tell me it's, I just can't. It's, 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 everything is an addiction, right? And if I think I can't help it, then I begin to act like I can't help. You can help it. Here, how about another temptation? That didn't seem to be too popular. How about this? You know, I'm in, I'm in Mary, this is Mother's Day. I'm in Mary to Paula 39 years. We were out the other day and we we're talking about how great it was to be able to say to each other face to face uh, that we've been faithful to each other. Now, does the temptation come to, to be unfaithful? I'm sure, I don't know. I haven't asked her. I'm sure maybe it does. I don't know. But here's how I have faced over the years the temptation to be unfaithful to my wife. It's in my mind. Number one, I think, if I cheat on her, she will kill me. That's number one. That's why we don't own guns around our house. Number two, if I cheat on her, why is it that men cheat on their good-looking wives with ugly women? That's another bad thing. If I cheat on her, then I will lose her. This is not good. It's taken me 30, seriously, 39 years to get her right like I want her. Why do I? I think in my mind, if I'm unfaithful to Paula, what does this say to my adult daughters? Most of the men they meet in the world are jerks. I just line up behind them. Really? Is that what I want for my life? I'm your pastor, which means you trust me to at least try to not be a jerk. So I've let all you down. So in my mind, I have a whole, I have a whole dissertation <laughs> written on why I want to be faithful to that woman. Not the least of which is I want God to find pleasure in the way I live. That makes sense? And I built this up in my mind. My mind is constantly being renewed. The world says everybody does it. It's not a big deal. Everybody has sex with everybody. You can't help it. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Why would God prohibit us from doing something we couldn't avoid not doing? I'm not the sharpest tool in the drawer, but even I know better than that. So God is renewing my mind. That's why he gave us a Bible. Of course, we don't read it, right? I mean, we have it. We leave here. We're going to go to the cafeteria and throw it in the back window. Most of us don't even bring one. I bet how many of you, what, did, cause you well, because Brother Dave is nice enough to print it. No, because I know you're lazy enough to not bring it. <laughs> I've learned after 21 years, I either print it or it don't get done. By the way, on Renegade this week, I did a whole show on how to buy a Bible. If you're interested, go to iTunes, search David Foster, Renegade's Guide to God, and you'll find it. God is constantly in this project, renewing my mind. He's also strengthening my will. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. How is he strengthening my will? He's strengthening my will, my resolve, through the principle of displacement. Now, there are two principles at work. Religion opts for the principle of denial. Okay? For example, you come to church, you get a good old fundamentalist preacher up there, slapping the Bible, beating it, sweating, sweating to the third row. You people need to stop smoking them cigarettes. You may, have to, may not go to hell. You don't have to smell like you've been there. You know, don't smoke. Okay, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke. Get out. I got a pack of Marlboros. Man, them things are good. Those are the ones I started smoking. I started smoking when I was 13. Again, I'm from Kentucky where that is a spiritual gift. 
I stopped, the first thing I stopped doing when I became a Christian is I started tithing and I threw my cigarettes away. I don't know why nobody told me to. But let's just say, you know, that's, that's something we, we shouldn't do. Should, how about, let's just get off of that because that's too convicting. How about chocolate? Y'all women need to stop eating chocolate. God has given me a work. No chocolate. And some of you says, well, I don't eat that much chocolate, but if you're going to tell me I can't have it, now I'm going to obsess over it. Right? <laughs> you with me? It's like saying to your dog, don't pee on the carpet. What does he go? <laughs> Even a dog knows that the denial doesn't do anything except make me want it even more. Hello? God operates in my will through the principle of displacement. In other words, stop denying desire. Just point it in the right direction. The only person who doesn't desire anything is dead. Okay. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will make your life miserable. That's what it says right there in the Hebrew. Delight yourself in the Lord. He give you what? Desires your heart, which means he started giving you a new heart. You are now conforming and forming and transforming your mind. You're now taking your desire, your will, and displacing all the negative and self-destructive and toxic emotions and will and desires with the things that build you up and are sustainable over time. Hello? All of a sudden now, instead of I ought to exercise, you want to exercise. Instead of I ought to go to church, I want to go to church, you get up and say, I get to go gather with these messy people and celebrate the goodness of God. Yeah, baby. Let's deal with emotion. And we said, you ask yourself this question, is this a temptation? Is this a test? Temptation is always directed toward the mind. Not emotion. The test always directed toward the will, resolve. And then we get to our emotions. That's the trial. Our trial. We change our emotions through good old-fashioned self-discipline. If I want the benefit of weight loss, then I simply discipline my emotion my, of, of I want to eat that hamburger for a time, I get the benefit, right? We know all about that. You see, God, the creator, created you mind, will, emotion. But this is how we live. We get up every day letting our emotions lead our life. I mean, you wake up in the morning and your foot will start talking to you, your other foot. I got out of bed first yesterday. You get out of bed today. I'm not getting out of bed. It's cold out there. Your mind has to say, shut up, get out of bed now. That goes to your will, and your will says, okay. And then your, your emotional feet say, I don't like it. Okay, I'll get out of bed. Right? Okay, let me, who doesn't want to feel the way, feel, who doesn't want to feel good? I want to feel good about my wife. I want to feel good about my life. I want to be, feel good about God. Here's how I do it. I get up and I live out of my mind. My mind, God says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, right? Every day his mercies are brand new. My mind says, get up. My will obeys my mind and my mind and my will dictate my emotions. My emotions say, I'll do it, but I'm filing a protest. <laughs> and you do that day after day, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, your emotions will start feeling that good feeling because you've been doing the right thing. You want to feel the right way? Do the right thing. You want to be loving towards your husband? Then do the right thing. Loving as he is, not as he ought to be, because Bubba, that's all, Bubba, that's all he's going to ever be until you love him to the place where he's so embarrassed to do nothing but change and be loving right back to you. Let's pray. 
Father, in Jesus' name, I pray this morning that you will set us free from this emotional, miniature life that so many of us have been trapped in. Help us to understand that you're changing us and you're morphing us and you're growing us, that you have a purpose and a goal, that it's a good thing, it's a God thing, it's a big thing, and we want to jump in. We want to cooperate with you. We want to give you our minds and let you program our minds. We want to think and learn to, and, and, and have your wisdom. Father, we want our will and resolve to come in alignment, that when the tests come, that we'll pass them every single time, that we have rock-solid resolve. And Father, when the trials come, that our emotions will be so self-disciplined, so trained, that instead of doing the easy thing, instead of doing the emotional thing, instead of being going to a pace of frustration, that we'll be in peace. That when we live through the gaps, we get through the gaps, still in one piece. Every day, still in one piece. Get a brand new job, still in one piece. Lose a brand new job, still in one piece. Get a brand new infusion of cash, still in one piece. Lose it all tomorrow, still in one piece. World falls apart, still in one piece. I get elected president of the universe, still in one piece. <laughs> Living in one piece. I get knocked down, but I get up again. I get knocked down, but I get up again. I will never be abandoned, ever, ever, ever. You love me too much to let me go, so let the adventure start. In Jesus' name, amen. Go get them. <laughs>